Thanks for joining the webinar today. Future proof your nonprofit for the changing world of work with Meta, formerly known as Facebook, as some of you know. Um, we know as um, nonprofits, the world is changing so fast with technology. And some of you may be finding it harder to recruit, retain, and engage staff, or just, just working in the technology world, period. So I'm going to show you how you can engage today, and our speaker is going to tell you more about how you can work in this changing world. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. If this is your first time here at TechSoup, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, our guest speaker will be answering your questions maybe midway or definitely at the end, but please put your questions in the midway. And feel free to chat with each other in the chat room. We are recording this. We'll send you the slides and the recording within 48 hours. So I'm gonna move out of the way and introduce our speaker today. I'm so, so glad she's here today. We have Beth Murray. She's the global lead nonprofits program at Meta. Um, she runs a program that support nonprofits to thrive in the metaverse. And I know we've been hearing that quite a lot. Um, Beth is an award-winning expert in organizational culture, communication, employee experience, and she's also a nonprofit advisor and a community active. This lady wears many, many hats. <laughs> So Beth, I'm so glad she to, 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 took the time, excuse me, to be with here this today. And I'm going to turn this over to you. So thank you so much. Fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. We are going to be talking about future proofing your nonprofit. So we're going to be focusing on a bunch of different things today, but really we're going to be talking about the trends that are driving the future of work. We're going to look at the building blocks of employee engagement. And these are principles that can apply to how you engage with your volunteers, how you how you engage with your advocates, how you engage with your employees. We're going to touch on how great leaders communicate, what, what are the principles you can put in place to make sure that you engage people the most. We're going to talk a little bit about how using technology to connect colleagues to your cause. And we're going to finish off um, with talking a little bit about Workplace for Good, which is one of the programs we run here at Meta. We know people have a lot of questions about the future of work. So hopefully you'll leave this meeting feeling excited and inspired around what's in the corner. Because to be honest, as much as we want to show you around what's around the corner, the real message is that the path to that future starts today. So as we go through this presentation, um, I'd love you to ask questions. We'll come to them at the end. But I want you to keep asking yourself a question, which is, am I doing everything I can right now to lay the foundation for whatever comes next? Am I building the right culture to take control of the future? Because, and I know this might be sacrilege as this is a text webinar, but the future of work isn't going to be defined by the technology we use. It's going to be defined by the people we work with to get there. And I think that's more important than ever when it comes to talking about charities and nonprofits. So even as we look ahead to the metaverse and all this other really exciting stuff, uh, what we really focus on at Meta, and I'm sure um, lots of other people are too, especially TechSoup, is how can we help you do the right thing for your people and your nonprofit right now? So let's keep that, that thought front and centre over the next 20 minutes or so. Before we start, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Workplace for Meta. You might have heard of um, this product, and this is what we partner with TechSoup on. I promise this conversation is not going to be a product push, but it just gives you a little bit of context as to why Meta, which is known for connecting friends, families, neighbours, communities, is talking about the future of work. Well, it's because of Workplace and because of the products. We also work on uh, Portal, Video Calling and Quest, which is, I mean, I have, um, I have some of my items here, but it's a uh, virtual reality headset. Years ago, when Meta was working out the best way to create a culture, to bring disparate people together in all the countries we work in and to work at speed, we built Workplace, which is a tool that looks and feels a lot like Facebook, but was just used by our employees internally. And when companies and nonprofits started coming to us and asking how we were growing so fast and had such happy colleagues, we realized there was an opportunity to turn Workplace into an external tool and make it available so that every company can have their own workplace. Today, Workplace looks and feels very different to that original Workplace. We've developed it into an employee engagement tool that connects everyone in an organization, whether it's behind a desk or on the front line. We have video calling, groups, chat, rooms, broadcasting. We have um, all sorts of ways to get your staff and volunteers together. 
it's separate from Facebook. That's really important. You have your own logins and you don't need a Facebook account to access it. Now, Workplace Today is paid for by over 7 million users around the world, but we donate it to nonprofits totally free of charge. So you can apply for that through TechSoup. You can access this with no cap on the number of people that use it. And we donate up to five workplaces for each nonprofit that's eligible. Um, we work with organizations that are very large, like Save the Children or Make-A-Wish or UNICEF, United Nations. But the majority of our users make up um, uh, small, medium-sized nonprofits around the world, community organizations like yourselves, public libraries, community centers, um, seal conservation charities. Um, and we work with them to help them build out their organizational content. So on to what you signed up for today. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the trends driving the future of work, because you'll see here I am in a spare bedroom at my house, which two, three years ago would have been unthinkable. Um, but the pandemic has dramatically and forever shifted the world of work. And really, it's accelerated the long term trends we expected to take a lot longer. There is a huge amount of research that shows the long term mental health impact of the pandemic. The anxiety around health, safety, financial concerns, how people adapted to work from home, how they're going to readapt in the future. And if you're anything like a lot of the nonprofits that I advise, it's been particularly hard for nonprofit employees, hit by huge fundraising challenges, and at the same time facing huge increased demand for services. The pandemic has presented a variety of challenges for organizations. But it's also presented opportunities to learn and accelerate improvements in the way that we learn, that we work and live. When the pandemic began, a lot of people, myself included, awaited the return to normal. But as time went on, there were even more that started realizing the benefits of a different way of working, because normal wasn't really doing it for the majority of the global workforce. The overwhelming majority of people have been getting very little out of work because they're not engaged with it. And it's not for want of trying. Nonprofits globally spend billions of dollars in recruitment, retention, benefits, morale, and even more on IT tools to get more productivity from our people. But a tool alone is never going to make a difference to how our employees feel, because we've overlooked the most crucial ingredient that makes employees engaged, and that's connection. People have the same desire to create connections and build community wherever they are including at work. Connection is the number one glue that binds an organization together. And we can't really predict what's going to happen until we really understand the major trends that have emerged over these last couple of years, and in particular, what we've been hearing from our customers at Workplace. Number one is frontline. So while knowledge workers, so that's those of us who might sit behind a desk, benefit from increased flexibility as a result of the pandemic, maybe you have, you're more able to work from home, maybe you have technology that allows you to work from different locations or flexible hours. There is a real risk that frontline workers, particularly those in nonprofits, are left behind. Because although frontline workers have carried the brunt of the impact of the pandemic and they represent the largest percentage of workers globally, they haven't benefited at all in the same way from some of the advances in culture or tech that we'll look at in some of these other trends. In fact, some of our research shows that they feel more disconnected than ever, with 70% of frontline workers saying that they've suffered from or feel a risk of burnout. Um, and finally, I would like to talk about the, the good and the bad of technology, because we all know, we've probably all experienced through the pandemic, how technology can connect us, but we've also seen the limitation of current options. I think today's really good example was some of our technical challenges. Um, it's never going to replicate being in a room. So let's talk about the future of work. There's four things that we think the future of work is going to be. So number one is more connected. In the metaverse, in the future, work is going to feel more connected because we're going to have a greater sense of presence than we've known before. And what I mean by that is that um, we have incredibly smart people around the world, and my company, but really across so many different organizations who are finding out ways, figuring ways that we can feel um, more embodied in online spaces. Number two is more collaborative. 
So when we have greater presence in these online spaces, in the metaverse, if that's what we want to call it, that's going to fuel new ways of working together. I spend a lot of my time in a headset, virtual reality headset, having meetings with people and little elements like the audio coming from the right space or being able to sit around a table with other people creates a sense of more seamless collaboration, which does make you feel a lot more productive and efficient. Number three is more flexible. So key to future ways of working is going to be greater autonomy. So when you're free from the physical world, you can choose when, where and how you work. And finally is more accessible. I was in one of those virtual reality meetings um, with colleagues today from Paris and Tel Aviv and Johannesburg. And as we remove uh, those boundaries, the world of work is going to be a lot more accessible to people who've typically been um, removed from it, people who maybe have disabilities, people who need additional support, people who ultimately have never been able to show up with the same amount of quality. That's going to really be benefit them. Let me tell you a little bit then about other ways that we see the future of work working. This is an example here, immersive learning. There are lots of different examples of how organizations today are um, using immersive learning to get far closer to um, what they do and to make sure that people are properly um, set up before they even join an organization. Uh, business like Accenture does all of its onboarding today in the metaverse where people can join um, special spaces which have been designed for Accenture employees walk through, meet with colleagues, and really experience what's going on. Now, this isn't a new concept. So think about how pilots for years have learned how to fly using um, using the special, um, Aretha, what's the word I'm looking for? Pilots for many years have used simulators. Yes, simulators. Simulators in order to learn how to fly. Or we have people who work in factories who've been learning how to use machines. Um, on simulators. This isn't new, but it does mean that we're going to be able to learn um, in a whole entirely different way. We have people in Walmart who are today learning how to use their technologies using the metaverse. Um, and really, there's a significant uplift in the amount of information that's retained when you do immersive learning versus just sitting in the classroom. There's also colleague training. So here are some pictures of colleagues at Walmart who are learning um, how to engage with tricky customers. You can role play different scenarios. There are ways that you can make sure that you're testing and learning um, before you're actually working with members of the public. Uh, I used to work for a nonprofit. We funded other organizations that um, were out there getting people into the world of work. And one of the fantastic new initiatives that one of the children's societies set up was that they realized that there were a lot of young people who had all the skills to thrive in the world of work, but they actually weren't able to um, even walk through the door of an office or a work environment because they were too they were they were too nervous about it. It was just too far away from their day-to-day -day work. So they were able to go and design an office environment, a walkthrough for those young people so that they were able to experience it before they got there, the nervousness was dissipated and it meant that they were able to turn up on their first day of work. So as we go through this presentation, I want you to remember one thing. We've talked about flexibility, we've talked about communication, we've talked about culture. I want you to remember that work is a thing you do, not a place you go. And let's move on to work out how do we, how, what does that look like within your nonprofit? And talk about the building blocks of employee engagement. Because when we ask ourselves, like, what, what, what is employee engagement? What is employee experience? It's really that in a nutshell. It's the experience that your employees or yourself have of working in your nonprofit. So it's physical space. What does that look like around uh, you? Are, are people working in drafty and wet offices? Are they working at field? Are they working in like high tech spec offices? Um, plus technology. So are they given the tools to actively be able to do their job? And finally, culture. What is the culture like? Are people friendly? 
Are people uh, willing to help out? Are people uh, competitive? Are people open? Are they transparent? All of these different things. Those things put together is the experience that an employee will have at your organization. And why it matters is because an engaged nonprofit worker is three things. Well, more than three things, but three main things. Number one, they're an active ambassador. There will be um, so many of us who are so passionate about the causes that we work with that we would chew the ear off anybody uh, sitting next to us on a bus or out and about. We will never know whether the person that we're talking to at that event or uh, on the train or at a party is somebody who's able to donate or move the needle or be an advocate. We want all of our people to be active ambassadors, um, passionate about not just the cause, but also about our organization in order to be able to have the greatest impact that we can. Secondly, an engaged nonprofit worker is more productive. That means that you, uh, you can see that they are having more of an impact with whatever it is that they're doing in their job. They're having, um, they're able to produce more or they're able to have more of a direct impact with the people whose lives we support. And finally, we'll stay with the cause for longer. We have a real issue in the nonprofit space of too many people joining for short amounts of time. This is for a whole bunch of different reasons. One of the reasons is um, you can't pay very much, and so people will often use nonprofits as a starter job, or they might move jobs in order to be able to get different benefits. But ultimately, if we engage somebody in the cause, and in our cause, they will stay with the organization for longer. Because there are three things that make up uh, an engaged employee's um, job and role. Number one is career. So we want people to have long-term careers with our organization. They need to be able to see progression. They need to be able to see that they are rewarded and recognized for the work that they do in their organization. Number two is cause. They need to feel like they have a direct connection to the cause that they are working for. We'll come on to talk about this in a second, but I've never worked in an organization that doesn't have some kind of frontline back office split where we have people who are on the front line who are working for a cause who feel like they are the cause maybe. Then we have people who work in the back office who, or as I like to call them, backbone organizations who might not who might feel more aligned to the fact they're doing finance than necessarily to the cause they're doing finance for so we need to make sure that everybody is really connected to the cause and finally community do they feel like they are part of a work community do they feel like they are connected to those people around them and do they feel like they are safe they are supported they are heard all the different things that make up a powerful and uh, a working community And I think it's really important, I'm just going to go back to that even to say that none of these things have to cost money. Making sure that people have a strong career so they know what their next move is, they know that their work will be rewarded internally and recognised, they know that they can see progression, they know that they will be able to grow their skills and their attributes, it doesn't have to cost money. Connecting them to the cause, that also doesn't have to, that have to cost you money. It's just important that they stay aligned and you are constantly reaffirming the cause of them. And finally, community. It doesn't have to cost money. It's about what culture are you building to make sure that everybody has that openness and that transparency that, um, and that feeling that love from their colleagues. And the way that you do that is through great leadership communication. I love this stat, or these two stats. 77% um, of leaders think they do a good job engaging their people, but 88% of employees say that their leaders don't communicate enough. I love this. Ultimately, there are a load of us, and I'd like you to think for a second about the greatest leaders you've ever worked for and their communication style, and maybe you want to share that in the chat. But there are a load of us out there thinking we are doing a fantastic job in leadership, but probably the people that are working for us or working with us don't think that we're doing a fantastic job in leadership communication. 
So just take a second and just, just share with us in the chat. Think about a leader you admire. How would you describe their communication style? I think the word is silent. Their communication style is silent. <laughs> <laughs> I think a few years ago, I think people were just like taking a moment and taking a beat. And yeah. I love uh, prancing for his foundation. Absolutely. Transparent is, is key. Uh, Daniel, they check in and they're considerate of my emotional and mental health well-being. They've got an open door. They're honest. They're assertive. All of these things are really important. Somebody can get in the weeds with us. Absolutely authentic they're themselves they're direct they're open they're inclusive all of these things are so powerful try and take a note of these and i will really um recommend that we keep these at the back of our minds because here are the five principles for great leadership communication number one is be strategic and i'll come on to talk about what all of these mean but number one is be strategic Number two is being relevant. Number three is be visible, so be out there, be seen. Number four is be engaged, as, um, as Adrian said, you know, get in the weeds. And number five is be yourself. So number one is uh, internal before external. Uh, here's an example of um, our CEO, sharing something uh, strategic, sharing what we do, making sure that he's sharing internally before sharing externally. So when we say a strategic communicator, we mean somebody that doesn't just go out there and talk to a community about a new initiative before what's happening, before telling your organization. We're talking about somebody who can properly think about how, where, and when they share um, alongside what they share. Number two, we were talking about um, being relevant. Now, it's really, really important. And the number one thing that's come through in those chats from everybody there was about being open and transparent. We have a uh, Can Rain Come Shine, a weekly all hands meeting where anybody across the organization can ask any question without fear or retribution, and everybody can, all these tools are on Workbase, but anybody can vote up or vote down the questions that they want to see answered. And leadership has an ongoing promise that the top five questions are always going to get answered. So what that means is like is, is about being out there, being open, being transparent, being honest, being accessible. I think this is a really important uh, slide because it's really about how are you also at the same time being yourself, being, being authentic and being relevant because nobody wants uh, a leader that is hiding behind uh, other people, but at the same time, everybody wants a leader that is thoughtful and compassionate about what's going on in the organization. Nobody needs to hear that you've just been out for a fantastic lunch with some board members if they are staring down the barrel of really tricky problems that you're not getting involved in. So you need to be out there and just to go back to these, you need to be visible and engaged in the issues that they are having alongside being yourself. I'm going to cover that quickly using technology to connect colleagues to your cause, but because I think this is really important. Now, I've talked already about how technology isn't the be all and end all, but you can use technology strategically to connect your colleagues to your cause. I've got some examples here uh, of how you can use technology to connect colleagues to your cause. And the number one, as you've all pointed out, has got to be about openness and transparency. So using technology to drive that transparency. Here we have some examples. Separate, clear professional goals for each employee, which link to the organization's mission and share those goals publicly. I love that example that a lot of people give of um, somebody coming across somebody sweeping a floor at NASA and saying, you know, what's your job here? And then saying, I'm here to help put um, the man on the moon. Everybody should know exactly how their professional goals link up to their team's goals, 
to their organizational goals and make sure that people are open about sharing these publicly because if you don't know what your colleague is working on or what their goals are then how can you come together and work on them together and make all internal impact information open source I came across an incredibly um, impressive nonprofit in New York City a few years ago called Pencils of Promise. And they were really, really transparent about the way that they shared their impact information, the number of schools they were working in, the number of young people they were able to work with. They used Tableau to set up a, an impact page, which they ultimately shared on their website. But it meant that everybody in the organization was able to see exactly how well the organization was doing or areas they needed support in and was able to um, always be able to advocate for the organization. It meant that if you had somebody working in the HR team who happened to come across somebody, they always had the up-to-date impact information and knowledge about the organization at their hands in order that they could always um, yeah, solicit donations, share information and get more people on board. I've mentioned already about prioritizing weekly all hands meetings where everyone can ask a question of leadership. You need to create a culture where people don't fear um, asking direct open questions. And in fact, they will respect that leader so much more if the person will answer those questions openly and honestly. I've seen um, a lot of examples where on workplace where and myself, I mean, I came across Workplace when I was working in a charity and we shared, uh, we launched Workplace. Somebody asked a really, really punchy question um, of our CEO. And the usual thing to do is like, in comms especially, you shut that down. You want to you get rid of those hairy questions. But in fact, it felt that the organization had taken a breath in and was waiting to see how the CEO responded to this. We could have taken it offline. But instead, the CEO was able to answer it in a really open, honest and transparent way, keeping those doors open, which meant that actually a lot more people around the organization respected him and respected the outcome of that. Number two, uh, drive productivity. It's not, it's not easy in nonprofits to find the money to get the tools to do the jobs. Uh, but I suspect that we've all spent a lot of time trying to work out logins trying to make an old computer work in a way that it should do. We need to prioritize giving colleagues the right technology and tools to do their jobs in the same way that we wouldn't expect them to sit out in the rain to do their job. We need to make sure that people have the tools to do their jobs so they're not spending their precious time fixing equipment. And we need to make it easy for them to find the information that they need to do their jobs. So we need to be using up-to-date, free or low-cost, tools like Workplace or Google Drive or Google Docs, those kind of things, so that people can find the information that they need at speed, cutting down on all that friction and drag so they can do their jobs quicker. And finally, how technology can bring people towards the cause. Um, and I'm sure you might have some other ideas. I'd love to hear them in the chat. But finally is drive connection. So Sharing information from the front line on internal social media can be incredibly powerful. You want to use your volunteers and colleagues that are out there on the front line, almost like news reporters for you. You want them to be taking photos, sharing stories, and reporting that internally in a way that will give your fundraising team ideas and anecdotes to take out to donors. You want to be filling up that heart bucket of people that are working in the background part of the organization um, and you want to be making sure that your comms team or your leadership has got that oversight of what's happening day to day out there in order that you can just get people logging on and feeling the warm and fuzzies on days that are not feeling so great for them. I also recommend day in the life so you can run job swaps between frontline and corporate teams to increase understanding or you can share profiles of what people are doing um, and what their job is involving in order to be able to build those connections in the community internally. And finally, and this is linked to the openness and transparency again, take suggestions for new ideas from all employees. So make sure that when we say there's never a bad idea, it can be that that actually is true. It can be really easy when you work in an organization for a long time to say, oh no, we've tried that, that's not a good idea, it wouldn't work because of X, Y, and Z. But actually, 
if you want people to feel connected to the organization and like they're part of a, a warm and nurturing community you need to be able to really create that um, that sense that anybody can bring a new idea to the table so i'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about workplace for good so workplace is where culture and technology come together to create a future of work that works for everyone everywhere. And nonprofits use us for three different reasons. They use us for organizational comms, so that imagine a private Facebook that just only your people or your volunteers are able to log into, where you can share what's going on in real time, run videos, have chats, broadcast. Um, the second way that people use us is for volunteering. You might want all of you might be thinking about how do I communicate with all my volunteers? Perhaps potentially they're all on a WhatsApp group, potentially you're emailing them all. Maybe you could think about what place is an environment that you could uh, put all your volunteers on. As I said before, you don't need a Facebook account. It's something you can just log into using a password if you want. And it means you can manage all of your volunteers. Um, it was a real lifeline for a lot of voluntary organizations during the pandemic. And finally, a community of practice. So this is a, a way that you might think about other organizations who are in your space, or maybe it might be a larger organization and you might have a load of different specialists in different locations. It's about how do you bring people together that maybe don't have a natural community in their organization and make sure that you can connect them with other people that are doing their job or their specialism so that they can build out their own community of practice and improve on the work that they do um, and feel more supported. Because we believe that the metaverse is just the latest chapter in a story that's constantly unfolding. Technology is changing, it's changed faster than it ever has before. But what is more important, what comes next in terms of the technology is the actions that we're taking today. So number one, are employees connected? Number two, can you reach and engage everybody everywhere? And number three, does your culture foster a sense of belonging? What are you doing to make people feel engaged and included and close to your cause? Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. And also <laughs> a perfect example of just how technology is working. Um, we have some questions. Beth, you did a great job, by the way. And I want to tell you, I'm serious, this is like one of the best webinars because with the things happening, people get to see, like, we're talking about the future of work. And it's just like all these things that happen, it's the future of work. So thank you. It is the future of work. And I think that we also need to recognize so many of our employees that work in the nonprofit space are often young. They're Gen Z. They have really high expectations of what they can be provided with. Email's not necessarily working for them because it's not something they've ever necessarily used. They expect to have always on chat. They, expect, they have all these new expectations. And so we need to be thinking about not just how we're running our communications, our technology now, but mm -hmm. what are we setting up to engage those people so we can get the most out of them, so that we can get the most out of them for the longest amount of time. Because ultimately, a lot of you know, the nonprofit world is no longer the only purpose-led sector anymore. We've got B Corp, we've got social purpose organizations, we've got social enterprises, what are we doing to make ourselves attractive employers? We don't have money, so we've got to get close to the cause. That's right. This is great. And um, there are a lot of people uh, in the chat. Are you able to see the q and A? I can. So okay. Jim and thank you, Hillary. That was so kind. Um, so um, Jim and David. David, you asked about what internal communications tools do we recommend? I mean, I'm obviously going to say work based uh, because it's because it's you know, what we use and it's what we donate. Um, and, it's, you know, there are so many tools out there that do work really well for lots of different organizations. But um, for us, when we focus on community first, how do we build that community? Workplace really works for us. Everybody has a profile. They share updates. There's chats. There's all these different tools that enable um, people to come together and feel close to each other. And Jim, you've asked about you know, are we going to talk about workplace? I, I don't, I'm, I'm conscious I don't want this to be a product push. So if you have specific questions around that, please let me know. But the best way to imagine it is to think of a private Facebook. 
um, which is separate to Facebook, but think about if you had your own private Facebook for everybody on there or somebody that worked with or from your organization. So you have your profiles, you have your um, all of your different tools to be able to talk to people um, and you can set it up how and where and when suits you best. Um, I am going to look and see if there are any other questions that have come through. Not in the chat, but in the Q&A section. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so Daniel has transitioned to a hybrid workforce, and our board isn't really sold on the idea of remote work despite us showing data proof of improved efficiency and employee satisfaction. How do you deal with those things? I mean, Daniel, I have come across a lot of people I've, I've come across a lot of people who do this um, and who, who are stuck back in the, those older days. And the fact is that you need to be pretty frank with them. You can best live your mission when you have engaged colleagues. You can best deliver your mission when you have colleagues full stop, because increasingly people are going to be leaving organizations that don't give them remote flexibility, at least as an answer. So it's a, it's a pretty much... Um, framing this not as a nice to have but as an organizational risk that you will lose your best performers and you will lose the people that care most about the organization if they do not sign off on remote work i would say um mitch how do you make sure that people with low vision can participate in virtual future i mean mitch this is something i'm really really excited about because in fact my first ever experience with vr was people who um, use a VR headset to bring back the vision of people who had lost about 95% of their sight. They brought back the peripheral vision of people uh, with low vision. So the new, the new headsets and technology that are coming out, the um, speech to text, the captioning, all of this stuff is, is being built with accessibility in mind. It's, um, it's not just about what we can see, but it's about what we can feel and touch, and it's about what the technology can do to improve on that low vision for people as well. Um, Amanda has asked uh, about, can I give a layman's ex explanation of what it is? So you might mean Meta, and you might mean Metaverse. Meta is the name of the company I work for, which used to be called Facebook, but we are... Uh, a company, a technology company that works across lots of different spaces. You might have heard of some of our products like Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp. Um, I work in a part for the Reality Labs, which is thinking about the future of work and also about the metaverse itself um, and builds products to help people enter the metaverse. Think of the metaverse as um, a more immersive version of the internet. So... It used to be that the internet was dial-up, that we would just we would access it through mainframe computers. Then at the um, then we started accessing the internet in a more social way through social media, um, still on our computers and on our phones. The metaverse is the next version of the internet. It's a more immersive, engaged way to almost step into our phones. It's going to be a way that. We are no longer going to be using phones or just computers to do our daily activities. Think of uh, glasses that people might be wearing. Think of when you go to a new place and you use Google Maps to try and make your way around and looking down at your phone to work it out. In the future, the metaverse is going to mean that we will be able to see in front of us, we will be able to see directions that are on the street in front of us. So think about maybe you go to Ikea, you see some furniture you like, you can use a, an application to look at that furniture in the space of your own home. So it's, it's an immersive way of the internet. Um, Adrian asked, what's a great way to ask staff and volunteers to give feedback so they can feel comfortable about asking? It's a really good question, Adrian. And I think that number one is they, they, they're going to have to see it and feel it before they totally trust it. Because everybody's experienced people asking for feedback that not really... Um, wanting to have frank feedback. So my example to you there would be make sure that you have some friendly people who can ask you some really punchy, difficult questions. And then make sure that everybody can see how you're answering those. Um, 
in a very open and warm and transparent way. So that might be Q and A, um, it might be chat, but I would recommend it isn't emails just simply because you're closing down that conversation. You want to have that as an open conversation so so many people can see how uh, how you're taking the feedback. Um, and Joanne, I don't know if I'm saying that right, I hope I am, um, was about how do you get people involved virtually during meetings? People don't ask questions during meetings, they ask afterwards. It's about the pre-prep there. So it's about making sure that you've maybe approached people in advance, um, that you've maybe seeded a couple of the questions that you want to have answered. Maybe you give them the opportunity to ask in a poll. So we do a lot of all hands at our organization and we do a lot of them company or team all hands and often you'll just ask a poll in advance what are the burning questions that you have and what that means is that people who may be a bit nervous to speak on camera they get the chance to ask those questions then there might be some live questions that just opens up that floodgate um lamel you are pivoting to social good are there free ways for people to try out vr ar tools without purchasing expensive equipment first Absolutely. So uh, AR, you can, there's so many tools out there, but from our perspective, you can go onto the Spark AR website, just view the Spark AR. Um, that's, a, that's a tool that we provide to help you build out AR tools. Um, lots of charities use it to make free um, fundraising tools, uh, filters for Instagram, those kind of things. Um, that's totally free. In terms of VR, there are lots of um, libraries and there are lots of um, local schools as well who are using VR headsets in order to, to deliver immersive learning. We'll often make those um, accessible. But I hear you. Like Access to the metaverse should not be um, dependent on, on purchasing expensive hardware. So um, I think it's really important that we do all we can to make, to make everything as accessible as possible. Paul has asked about, there are different metaverse platforms now, are there efforts to connect and converge them, any evolving standards? Paul, that is a million dollar question and we have four minutes. But the fact is that nobody, <laughs> it's really important that nobody owns the metaverse. It's really important that there are different platforms and it's really, really important that um, everybody has the same ability to build for and in the metaverse. But yes, 100%. There are efforts to connect them. So interoperability is a really key buzzword at the moment about how can you make sure that people can use the same avatar in different environments, that people can take the same, um, that if you buy a tool in one place, you can take it with you around the metaverse. Because everybody that's building realizes that people want the same things. And I think if you look back to the, the the Wild West days of the internet, a really good example here is um, when you type in uh, a website, you will type in, often type in like HTTPS in advance of putting in the address. Now that's a security protocol which uh, was agreed right at the beginning of the, of the internet by a whole bunch of different people who said, you know what, we need to get security right. We need to develop some interoperable standards that are gonna work across the basis of everybody's work. Um, and that's the work that's going on today. There's lots of different um, groups of academics and researchers and thinkers and technologists and politicians and companies that are currently working on, like, how do we build up an interoperable world where everybody can build up from that? Okay, I think that's all the questions. Yeah. Um, and I think we've pretty much come to the end of our time as well. Um, Jim, Meta Workplace is not just really to nonprofits for 30 days. It is free in perpetuity. Um, everybody can, but however, we wouldn't expect you to go through a text suit validation process without, you know, locking on and trying it for yourself. So if you go to workplaceforgood.org or just Google Workplace for Good, you can go through and you can set a free 30-day trial. Check it out, see if you like it, see if it's for you. And if you do, within those 30 days, you can just go through the text suit process and sign up and then you'll have um, long-term free access. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I did want to, Jeffrey just dropped a question in Q&A. Where can I experience the metaverse? Where is the website or platform on the internet? What can have a 
example or sample? So I'm absolutely loving all of these metaverse questions. And I'm going to take it as a, not an excuse to dodge the questions, but to encourage you to Google um, and maybe we can send this out, uh, send out the link in um, uh, the, the post event email, if that's a thing, Aretha. But I'm going to send you to the nonprofit education conference that we ran last week because I ran a session there on uh, Metaverse 101. 20 minute session on all the different ways you can access the metaverse, the low cost, no cost, how nonprofits are accessing it, what fundraising opportunities there are there, ways to engage your people. And hopefully there's a lot of content there that um, that will give you that that low cost, no cost access to the metaverse. Awesome. So much. Thank you so much, Beth. I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, you worked through this like like butter, I'm telling you. You were awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Aretha. I really appreciate your time. And everybody, you know what You know what I said this whole way through? It's about creating community. And what creates community? Adversity. So I really appreciate you sticking with us and, um, and being so engaged in this topic. Awesome. Thank you, guys. You'll be getting recording and the slides and the links um, within 48 hours. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.